Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 447, LMM. I am temporarily well, I think. I'm in sort of a temporary recording setup. I hope it sounds okay. Uh, Welcome to our first episode of Anne of Green Gables. I know it has been a long time coming. I apologize for the length of time it has taken, and I thank you for your forbearance and patience in waiting for us to finally start Anne of Green Gables. I'll have to be honest with you, I was not convinced that there would be anything for me to actually say when it came to Anne of Green Gables, but, oh, it's going to be interesting. There's a lot that's going on in Lucy Maud Montgomery's life. It's, it's not necessarily exactly what's going on in Anne, but there are, there are some interesting things happening in and around Lucy Maud Montgomery, which is why we are going to talk about her first uh, a little bit today, and then next week we will start the book itself. But just like with Alexandre Dumas or Charles Dickens or Lewis Carroll, there there are some interesting uh, tidbits and background information that you may not know, some of which has only come to light since 2008, so you really may not know some of this. I think it will add depth and richness to Anne of Green Gables instead of, you know, doing something horrible like destroying a childhood icon, because I found that it added a great deal for me to the reading of the book in all of the right ways, in all of the kind of heartbreaking and beautiful and touching and magic of childhood ways that uh, that I think young readers of Anne of Green Gables have enjoyed over the years. Now, I will do my best to give you a heads up if I'm going to talk about something that you might not want young readers to listen to, um, because it is perhaps a little bit more adult, or because as a child wouldn't necessarily add anything to their reading, but it might in fact detract a little bit from their reading. I think once you're an adult, we tend to come to books like this with a different eye, a different lens. I mean, we've we've lived longer, we've experienced more, we remember our own childhood, but we remember it through the veil, as it were, of adulthood. Uh, so I think we might be more interested and more energized by some of this information. So, first, if you are new to the Craftlit podcast, normally what happens over the last almost 12 years is I would have a little bit of crafty chat, uh, sharing something that I had come across or that uh, of late someone had sent me and uh, and that wanted me to share with you about uh, any kind of crafting. We've had all sorts of interesting crafts that we've talked about, we've mentioned, we've had people on. Uh, A while ago, I had started a list of Craftlet listeners who do really interesting things. And as has happened from time to time with the last 12 years, uh, life got complicated and I didn't have the time to pursue any of that. I still have the list. I am hoping that I'll be able to start doing that again because as life has gotten more complicated, I've had less and less time to learn new crafty things. Um, Although I have to tell you, I am currently surrounded by yarn and spinning fiber, beautiful spinning fiber, and my hands are itching. The spirit is willing. I don't know if the if the amount of sleep will keep me going to be able to get back to doing 
any of these things. I know that the Winter Olympics has just started as well, which means Tour de Fleece. And I, I know that once again, I am just simply not going to be able to participate. But I hope that those of you who are participating will find that the Anne of Green Cables background information and the first couple chapters next week will help keep you going as you spin your merry way through the Winter Olympics. Once I get past the crafty chat or whatever chat starts the show, I then move into book talk. And all that means is I give you audio annotations for the upcoming chapter or chapters that we will be listening to that day. And then I'll play you that audio so you can have the audio book and the audio notes all in one place, listen to the whole thing. And then if I have any commentary to add at the end or reminders for you, I will pop back on before I let you go. It's a pretty simple setup. There's certainly no requirement that you do anything crafty while you are listening. I know from many, many emails that I've received that I have listeners who do their house cleaning while they listen. I have listeners who run the vacuum because they have really good headphones, uh, do dishes, nurse children, go into labor and maintain their sense of calm while they are in labor while listening to the podcast. We've had all sorts of interesting listener stories over the years, and I love hearing those from you. They they make me very happy. So there's no requirement that you be crafty. There's certainly no requirement that you be female. We have had some great interactions with some of our male listeners over the years, notably Ken in Honolulu. Hello. I hope you are still listening, even though we are now heading into what might be considered a chick book. Ken was listening while we did The Count of Monte Cristo and had a lot of, I think, important insights into Guy Think, especially early on in the book. Uh, if you haven't listened to The Count of Monte Cristo and you are jonesing for some extra audio, <laughs> there are, what, 70 episodes that covered The Count of Monte Cristo? It was a big, big book. So you have at least 470 hours of previous craft lit, free craft lit episodes to listen to. And then there are also premium episodes. That is a completely separate, non-crafty audiobook stream that parallels Craftlet. In the past, those episodes came out on Saturday morning at 10. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to maintain that schedule, but I cannot guarantee it. Everything has changed a little bit since we've moved, and I'm, I'm still in that figuring out stage. But if you're interested in finding out more, you can go to craftlit.com slash membership, or you can go to craftlit.libsyn.com and click on the red banner. If you follow the instructions to sign up there, you will be able to access the premium audio at that website, as well as via the Craftlit app. We have on every possible portable device platform, that's iOS, Android, and Windows, uh, you can download the Craftlet app on any of those platforms and listen to both the free and the premium audio there. But only if you sign up for the premium membership at that one website, craftlit.libsyn.com. The reason for this is that Libsyn is my host company. They're the ones who create the podcast feed and disseminate it everywhere. YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher Radio. Uh, apparently, we are on Spotify. There's been some confusion about how to get that, and I have still not gotten any clarity on that, so I'll let you know when I know. Uh, but Libsyn is the hosting company. They take my audio file and they make it available everywhere. and. They are the ones who built and who maintain the app. The only thing I have to do with the app is I provide them with the audio and the art. We are also on Patreon, but I'm not making a big deal about it right now because they've changed some of their policies and I'm still trying to figure out whether this affects us positively 
or negatively. So yes, Patreon is still happening. Yes, the audio will still go up on Patreon. No, I'm not sure if we're going to stay there. I'm working on it. Uh, Certainly, if you have any responses, reactions, or thoughts on the whole Patreon thing, please let me know. You can always get a hold of me at heather at craftlit.com. Well, now that I'm back, you can get a hold of me at heather at craftlit.com. Or you can call our listener call-in line at area code 206-350-1642. And if you call that, that arrives in my hands as an MP3 file, which I can then share with everyone else. So it is both a listener feedback line in that you can call and just talk to me. You can use the app to call that phone number and talk to me, or you can call that number and record a message for me to share with everyone. Just let me know if what you're saying is private and personal, just between us, or if it is for public consumption, so that I know what you want me to play and what you don't. And that is pretty much the entire schmickecki. That's the whole thing. So, that being said, let's talk a little about Lucy Maud Montgomery and Anne of Green Gables. So the first and most important thing to know is that Lucy Maud Montgomery was born in 1874 in Clifton, Prince Edward Island. This, to me, is hugely important because I I feel it's my duty to sing to the world that Anne Shirley was not a real person, but Lucy Maud Montgomery was. And while she did receive credit and lauds for her work at creating Anne Shirley and several other uh, also well-loved book series, uh, she, she continuously saw her work Uh, marginalized, well, herself marginalized as being, quote, not a serious author, because, of course, she's only writing for children in general and girls in specific, so it was a double whammy. But she also saw herself marginalized as everything that happened during her lifetime that praised her writing didn't praise her. It was the home of Anne Shirley, Prince Edward Island, home of Anne Shirley. This had to have been, and in fact was, galling to poor Lucy Maud Montgomery. People who knew her talked about the fact that she was uh, smart, funny, pleasant to be around, all of these things. And I think that that is important, especially looking back on conversations that I've had with you like right after Robin Williams died. And the difference between being sad and being depressed and having depression. Depression being a a constant state of mind where it is as though you were looking at a very sunny, beautiful world through a very dark gray veil. And while you can laugh and interact and be funny yourself in depressive phases if you if you are able to pull yourself out of the hole that you are in and get out and interact with the world uh, being funny is not the same as feeling happy and being clinically depressed is not the same thing as being sad and There's a lot about Lucy Maud Montgomery's history that made all of my, wow, that sounds like depression bells go off. And it didn't help that she was often surrounded by, and in fact married to, uh, other people who suffered from depression as well. The fact that she was able to accomplish as much as she did was, to me, extraordinary, because she accomplished an awful lot. Many people equate authors and their main characters with each other, uh, people thinking that 
Mark Twain was Tom Sawyer or Mark Twain was Huck Finn. The same thing happened to Lucy Maud Montgomery, people assuming that she and Anne Shirley were the same person. This is not true. Uh, she actually had said that several times, that uh, several times publicly and many times in private, in diaries and in letters to friends, that she's not Anne Shirley. However, she was able to draw on things that happened to her in her life and mold those things into this creation, this Anne Shirley girl. The most notable similarity, of course, is that before she was two years old, her mother, uh, Clara Woolner McNeil Montgomery, died of tuberculosis. Her father was not able to cope particularly well, and he wound up leaving Lucy Maud with her maternal grandparents. And then when he was seven, when she was seven, he moved away. He moved to um, what's now Saskatchewan. It was the Northwest Territories at the time. And, and at that point, she was pretty much just left with her, her grandparents, Alexander McNeil and Lucy McNeil. And, uh, and they lived in Cavendish, which was not too far away from where she was born. She was very lonely. She was quite clearly an only child at that point. And that was, according to her, the reason that she wound up being able to, as an adult writer and as a child, as a coping mechanism, she was creating complete and very detailed imaginary friends and imaginary worlds you know, so she'd have someone to talk to, pretty much. And in the early chapters of Anne of Green Gables, you are going to see such extraordinary and subtle examples of the depth of pain that is involved in some of these creations, because this is the one place where I really do think that Anne Shirley and Lucy Maud Montgomery are a hundred percent aligned. And it's within the first seven to 10 chapters of Anne and Green Gables that there were passages that made me weep. I don't know if they were meant to, but that was certainly the effect that they had on me. Uh, knowing what I knew about uh, Lucy herself. Now, her family's background is Protestant. Um, they're Scottish originally. Woo! And Craftlet is going to Scotland this June. So uh, I'm going to keep pushing that Scottish connection between Lucy Maud Montgomery. And uh, and she did eventually get to go travel and and see Scotland and, and the UK. And uh, and that, that was cool too. But early on, she... Even as early as 13, she had written in her diary that she knew she was going to be famous, that this was her her goal. She wanted to be known. She wanted to be a, a little local celebrity. She wanted to have her work recognized for being as good as it is, as it was, and it, as it continues to be. She did submit uh, poems to local papers and you know, got turned down and it was awful and she was crushed, but she knew she was going to be able to uh, make it eventually. And, and she did. She had um, a summer, no, she, I think she spent an entire year in 1890. So she's 16 years old. She spent that uh, in Prince Albert with her father and her stepmother. She said it was not a happy marriage and it was not a happy time, but it did allow her to escape into her writing, and she published. Uh, she had a poem published, and then she had another piece, uh, an article published in the newspaper, and and this was huge. I mean, she wasn't even seventeen years old yet. This was great, and she was finally able to go back to uh, Prince Edward Island, where she would go on these long walks and have these great moments of a uh, kind of transcendence in in the nature as she was out and walking around. You will see elements of that in Anne of Green Gables as well. The other thing that I think is really important to know about Lucy Maud Montgomery, 
She, like most women, uh, she's unmarried. She's finished her uh, primary and secondary education. She now has a choice. What is she going to do? She is going to go to get her teaching degree. It was a two-year program. She completed it in a year. She went on to study literature at Dalhousie University in Halifax, in Nova Scotia. She finished a two-year teaching program, degree program, in a year. One of the problems that Lucy Maud Montgomery had during her life and early life and will continue to have for the rest of her life is that she is too smart for her own good, which I mean in both the best and the worst of ways. I think uh, women have historically found this to be tricky because especially back when we're, we're talking about the, uh, at this point, the 1890s, women's roles were fairly restricted and children's roles were fairly restricted as well. And some of those restrictions had to do with the social class of the woman in question or the child in question as much as it had to do with anything else. Uh, very poor children, of course, were labor. And wealthier children or, or children who had a, a few more means than others might were in an interesting time period because we're moving out of the uh, children as little adults who are to be uh, apprenticed at a relatively young age to learn a trade, whether that would be being a housewife and a mother or uh, taking on the family business or the father's uh, occupation, or perhaps an occupation that interested them more, thinking about, again, Ben Franklin. Women who were too smart for their own good often caused trouble. <laughs> trouble for themselves, trouble for their families, trouble for those around them. And if you've already read Anne of Green Cables, you know how it starts to show up in that book as well. Unfortunately, Lucy Maud Montgomery's intelligence did get in her way. Uh, she was beautiful, and not beautiful in a heart-stopping, breathtaking, supermodel kind of way, but beautiful in this bright-eyed, almost mischievously pretty. She's she's the the Betty Cooper to Veronica Lodge. She's kind of the girl next door, really pleasing to the eye. And and she does. She has in a lot of these photographs of her, she has this kind of little quirky smile going on that makes you think number 1 she'd be fun to go and have a drink with, and number 2 she was thinking all the time, probably not a little ironically, about things like getting her picture taken. And in fact, later on, she did have this letter that she had written to a friend of hers where she'd had a, a difficult, well, she'd had a difficult marriage and a difficult day in that marriage. And she wrote to her friend that this little 10-year-old tragically 10-year-old girl had written to her from New York saying, oh, please, I just can't sleep anymore without knowing what you look like. Please send me a picture. I, I try to go to sleep at night and all I can do is wonder what you look like. And she said, God, if this child could have seen her that morning wrestling the furniture in her houseworking dress with her hair falling all over the place, cussing, which is what she said, <laughs> cussing at the furniture and you know, covered in ashes and dirt and miserable, uh, the child would get over herself in a hurry. But instead, she figured she would go and pull one of the official author photographs that had been taken of her, as she put it, while she sat in rapt inspiration, apparently, at her desk with a pen in her hand and a gown of lace and silk with her hair just so, so she's going to send that to the girl so that she doesn't completely disillusion the poor child. And I I loved that. I loved the realness of that. And it kind of made me wish that she'd had a picture taken of her wrestling the furniture, just so the rest of us <laughs> as adults could maybe be not disillusioned with 
other people's Instagram feeds and Facebook pages that make it look like they are supermodels who always have a perfect house that always looks marvelous, when in fact, they are more than likely just like the rest of us and have mornings where they are cussing at the furniture as they rustle it back into place. So there will be more about Lucy Maud Montgomery that we talk about, but the important parts are lonely childhood, too smart for her own good. She had lots of suitors. She had one true love. For lots of complicated reasons, she turned him down and he died in the influenza epidemic of uh, 1918. She did her best to do good in the world outside of her writing. This included trying to drum up support to go and fight in World War I. She was horrified by the rape of Belgium. As time went on and she learned more about the war, she uh, regretted some of that. There's a, a character that shows up in some of the Anne books, um, a Piper character, like the Pied Piper of Hamelin kind of thing. The first time he shows up, he is a positive character. The second time he shows up, he's a more insidious and dangerous character. This has a lot to do with her uh, evolving attitudes towards war and fighting. And here's where, if you are listening with small children, you may want to skip the next couple minutes. Uh, some of the fighting that she did was with her husband, who she did eventually marry. He was a Presbyterian minister. He had some real issues. I mean, real issues of uh, depression, uh, melancholia to the nth degree, eventually leading him to determine that, and you, you can go back and listen to uh, The Scarlet Letter to get more conversations on this, um, but eventually, as a Calvinist, it led him to believe that he was not a member of the elect, and that therefore he and his wife Lucy and his children would all go to hell. You can imagine that to a depressed mind, this did nothing to help. And in fact, it, it drove him to a point where he did, in fact, start to physically abuse Lucy. Her children were out of the house by that point. Um, it was not a happy marriage. She did not have a happy life. World War II dealt her another heavy blow. And in fact, in 1941, had written to a friend, this past year has been one of constant blows to me. My oldest son has made a mess of his life and his wife has left him. My husband's nerves are even worse than mine. I have kept the nature of his attacks from you for over 20 years, but they have broken me at last. I could not go out to select a book for you this year. Pardon me, I could not even write this if I had not been a hypodermic. She was getting medicine for her depression. The war situation kills me along with many other things. I expect conscription will come in and they will take my second son, and then I will give up all effort to recover because I shall have nothing left to live for. Uh, conscription did come in, and in her last entry in her diary, on March 23rd, 1942, she wrote, Since then my life has been hell, hell, hell. My mind is gone. Everything in the world I lived for has gone. The world has gone mad. I shall be driven to end my own life. Oh God, forgive me. Nobody dreams of what my awful position is. A month later, on April 24th, 1942, Lucy Maud Montgomery was found dead in her bed in her home in Toronto. Her death was recorded as coronary thrombosis. However, in 2008, her granddaughter revealed that Montgomery had, in fact, suffered from depression, very likely as a result of caring for her husband and being abused by him for so many years. Uh, but also, I would posit because she was a woman too smart for her own good in a time when that was not an easy thing to be. And it is the conventional wisdom of the family that she took a drug overdose. There was a note that was found by her bedside, and there is some uh, discussion as to wit whether this was a suicide note or uh, a part of a larger journal entry than the rest of the entry has been lost. 
But what she wrote was, I have lost my mind by spells, and I do not dare think what I may do in those spells. May God forgive me, and I hope everyone else will forgive me, even if they cannot understand. My position is too awful to endure, and nobody realizes it. What an end to a life in which I always tried to do my best. During her lifetime, she published 22 novels, more than 500 short stories, an autobiography, which is how she would like to be remembered, and a book of poetry. She had started in 1920 to recopy her journals and edit them to make sure that what was remembered of her was what she wanted to have remembered of her. And as heartbreaking as it might be to think of her having ended her own life, I think it is also important for us to notice that it is very possible that the people around us who are the funniest, the quickest, the most engaged, if you suddenly notice that they've dropped off the map for a little while, it might be a good idea to check in on them. Because it is very possible that those are the people who are privately and secretly wrestling with depression and just checking up on them every once in a while to say, hey, can I bring you a coffee? I don't care if you're in your pajamas. Let, let me swing by and say hi. It could do a world of good. All of that said, we know that that is not the way that Lucy wanted to be remembered, although I think knowing the struggles that she had makes her that much more impressive and the work that she did that much more incredible. And also incredible because she had to fight for it. She had to fight for her recognition, but she also had to fight for her income. Aside from her husband, though, some of the unhappiness in Lucy's life was that the uh, American publisher of her books was a truly horrid person who was actually known for cheating his authors. She was getting seven cents for each book. She was supposed to contractually have gotten 21 cents for each book that was sold in the, in the United States by this one publisher. Um, the lawsuits went on for 10 years. Um, it was as ugly as it could get. Uh, when she won the lawsuit, he made it very clear that he was n under no circumstances going to pay her. That went on. His behavior most likely contributed to the death of his younger brother, who had worked with him up until shortly before the time of his death, because irony. And this horrible publisher then started saying publicly that Lucy Maud Montgomery had caused the death of his younger brother because of her lawsuit. This guy kept yelling it so much and so loud that all of his authors left, and all he could do at that point was just republish books that he already had the rights to. Served him right. But you can imagine that this was hugely demoralizing. At the same time, or bookending this, actually, at the same time, there were two movies that were released of Anne of Green Gables. This jerk publisher had sold the rights for the films. So there was a, a 1919 film, and then there was another one in the 30s, I think. And uh, neither of them were great, according to Lucy Maud Montgomery. And one of the things that she wrote about the 1919 version, she wrote this in her diary, Anne was changed from a Canadian to an American. This is like changing Harry Potter from a Brit to an American. This is horrifying to me, as it was to her. She wrote, it was a pretty little play, well photographed, but I think if I hadn't already known it was from my book, that I would never have recognized it. The landscape and the folks were, quote, New England, never Prince Edward Island. A skunk and an American flag were introduced, both equally unknown in Prince Edward Island. I could have shrieked with rage over the latter, such crass, blatant Yankeeism. 
And it went worse than that. She didn't even mention this in her diary. There was a, a Los Angeles premiere, and an American journalist said that the Anne of Green Gables was written by a Mr. Montgomery. And Montgomery's only mentioned as a man or a woman briefly because the whole focus of the article was on Mary Miles Minter, who was presented as Anne, the real Anne Shirley. Uh, Montgomery did not like the way this Minter girl played her. She was very Pollyanna. She was very, like, saccharine. And Anne is not sweet heroin material. She's far more complicated and interesting than that. And even worse, there was a scene in the movie where Anne Shirley picked up a shotgun to threaten people. I mean, oh my God. I, 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 I don't even want to go see if I can find the movie. I'm so horrified by that. It's, it's such a travesty that that happened and that people watched the movie instead of reading the book. Luckily, you know, people like us, Thing 2 recently was all jazzed about seeing that uh, A Wrinkle in Time was coming out. And it looks like a really interesting production that maybe for the first time is trying to do justice to the, the science as well as the magic, as well as the complex kid world relationships. And I know one of the hardest things about A Wrinkle in Time is Charles Wallace and the age that he is in the book. I'm curious to see how they pull it off in this new version with Oprah. How can you not like Oprah? But the thing that I think you will appreciate is one of Thing Two's friends said, oh, I want to go see that movie. I want to go see it with you. And he turned to her and said, have you read the book? And she said, no. And he said, when you've read the book, come back and talk to me. And I thought, yes, we win. Ha <laughs> ha. The four, new 14-year-old, he just turned 14. The new 14-year-old, I have finally brought him over to the bright side. It's all very good. And, by the way, thing one is hearing back from colleges. So, right now he's been accepted to School of Visual Arts in New York and Pennsylvania Academy of Art and Design and UArts in Philly. He's waiting to hear back from Savannah. College of Art and Design, and Pratt. It's a very interesting time right now in the household. But he's growing up lovely, so I can't complain. Anyway, sorry for the little child commercial there in the middle, but I, I know some of you have been following them for the last 12 years, and the fact that Thing One is now about to head off to college next year probably made you want to go get a drink the same way it does to me. Anyway, books rather than movies. Uh, there has been some controversy about the most recent Anne of Green Gables adaptation for television. Um, the one that was done in the, was it late 80s, early 90s? I'm going to put links to these in the, in the show notes at craftlit.com slash 477. So if you want to go and, and hunt down these, you can. Um, but I know that the one that was done previously was much beloved. And uh, very sadly, the guy who played Gilbert died not too long ago. Uh, of course, he is no longer 16 years old, but still, he's awfully young. So that was very sad. Um, but the the new Anne of Green Gables that came out within, I think, the last year or two uh, hit a bit of a controversy because some people said that it was uh, much darker than the book. I am in the process of watching... Uh, both of these series now, and I will let you know how I feel about that criticism. In the meantime, I would like to invite you for two things. One, let me know what you think about the different versions that people can watch on the small screen, but also please consider calling our listener line 1-206-350-1642 and tell us what it was about these books that attached you to Anne Shirley forever and ever. 
especially if you read these books when you were a child. I am fascinated. As a girl who grew up as a Laura Ingalls Wilder girl and not an Anne Shirley girl, I would love to be able to play for everyone a clip of what it was about Anne of Green Gables that jazzed you so when you were a kid. And again, there is the listener call in line, 1206-350-1642, but there is also our SpeakPipe page, which is speakpipe.com slash craftlit, or if you go to the craftlit.com website, and this episode is craftlit.com slash 477, you will see a little tabby on the right-hand side of the page that says send feedback or tell us what you think or something like that. And if you click on it, it will open a SpeakPipe recorder. And if you're on a laptop or a computer that has a microphone, or if you're on a phone that has a little headset doohickey that you can use with it, you can send us a minute and a half long message that way. And that's something you can do internationally for free, which is not true, I know, of the listener call in line. That was the the best I could do. So, Two different ways to send audio feedback. Of course, you can always send us your thoughts at heather at craftlit.com and let us know why you loved Anne so when you were a kid. Or if you came to her as an adult and fell in love with her then, that would be great to know too. That kind of gives us the broad strokes of Lucy Maud Montgomery's life. Next week, we will do uh, the first few chapters. Uh, some of them are are... It's not that they're so short, it's that they really need to go back to back to back. And um, and some episodes we won't need to do that with. Actually, Lucy Maud Montgomery's chapter length is fairly regular, which is lovely of her to do for us. So I think that's everything you need to know as a kickstart. Uh, we will have another Jeeves story for our premium audio tomorrow. Thank you again to my premium listeners for your forbearance and patience as well. Um, Patreon did charge you in January. They shouldn't have charged you in February. And the Patreon page should be all back up and raring to go. So let me know if something has gone horribly, horribly wrong with that as well. I think that's it. I hope you've had a great holiday, a great start to your new year, a great start to your February, and take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.